Along with Inspiring Forgiveness, Barbara Bonner is the author of Inspiring Generosity, and that came out in 2014, and then Inspiring Courage, which came out in 2017. She's spoken widely on the subjects of generosity and leadership, and is a frequent contributor to the Huffington Post. After starting her professional life as an art historian, Barbara has devoted her career to nonprofit management, fundraising, and philanthropy. A 30-year resident of New York City, Barbara now lives in a converted barn in the Berkshire Hills of Western Massachusetts. Tonight, Barbara will discuss and read from the stories, poems, and quotes in the third of her trilogy. This encouraging guide is, is her contribution to our angry and grudge-holding world. Inspiring Forgiveness consists of 12 true stories of people from the Dalai Lama to Congressman John Lewis, who have endured great pain at the hands of others and have found a way to open themselves to forgiveness in its many forms. Each story is followed by extraordinary poems that speak to forgiveness. And the book is also a collection of over 100 inspiring quotations. So with that, I welcome you, Barbara, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Linda. What a pleasure to be back at Gramercy. Um, what a beautiful bookstore it is. And I'm imagining myself in that lovely room. Um, to be back, asked back a second time, I must have behaved myself fairly well the first time. So I thank you for the invitation. And I, I also want to really applaud you for all that you've done in the last eight months. Uh, you and so many wonderful independent bookstore owners to really bring reading into our lives in a new way and to make stores sort of cultural and literary hubs in the city. Uh, I'm on your email list. I keep tabs on you on Facebook and you've done such wonderful things. It's really, so it's a double honor to be here because of that. I also must say, I think I'm probably uh, riding the coattails of my wonderful son-in-law, the novelist Alex George, who spoke uh, at Gramercy two weeks ago but they are wonderful coattails, so I'll take it. Uh, what I'll do is just speak a little bit extemporaneously, but I'll also read a lot of remarks having entered the age of forgetfulness. Um, and then we can open it up into a lighter Q&A at the end, if you like. So after writing my first two books on generosity and courage, friends would ask me if I were working on a third. Uh, as you probably know, writers don't really like to talk with their, talk about what they're writing on. So I'd sort of mumble, well, yes. And then if pressed, I'd say, well, forgiveness. Well, universally, I would then say, here it comes, a sort of a downward gaze, shaking of the head, woo tough one, they'd say. <laughs> Not one said, oh, wow, I can't wait to read it. Uh, this nearly universal reaction was followed by the person in question then saying, uh, recounting something that had happened in their lives, uh, some insult or injury, uh, and that would always end telling the story by saying, and I'll just never forgive him. So I tried not to let these uh, reactions dampen my commitment to the subject. And I certainly didn't tell my publisher that this was what I was hearing. Well, there were times I thought maybe I should be writing on the vices instead. But uh, instead, it really piqued my curiosity as to why this is such a tough subject for so many of us. How many times do we hear someone tell a story of being harmed, wronged, insulted, treated badly, and the recitation invariably ends with, and I'll never forgive him. How does that thought insinuate itself so insistently into the telling of the story? Why aren't we able to simply describe what's happened, the wrong that's occurred, instead of moving into non-forgiveness? I tend to think, after immersing myself in this for a while, 
that it's because we're such judging creatures. It's what these minds of ours, especially our egos do. We're just born to do. We're always on the lookout for ways that we can take comfort in being right. We can't seem to let go of the need to be right. The facts are in our favor, a wrong has been committed. We recognize what's happened with our big discerning brains, but then we have to attach like glue to calling it out. What happened was simply unforgivable. So what do we do with unforgivable? We blame, we point fingers, we hold grudges, we heap scorn upon the offenders. As the great fifth century Buddhist teacher, Buddha Gosa said, harboring anger and resentment are like holding a burning ember in your hand, waiting to hurl it at the enemy and realizing that you're the one who's being burned. Scientists offer another perspective. We're actually hardwired to remember pain and loss. Fred Luskin, head of the Stanford University Forgiveness Project, says that our brains are designed to maximize remembrance of suffering so we can be alert in case it happens again. So let me just turn to a short excerpt from the introduction to the book to give you an overview of how I tackled this. True forgiveness asks us to open our hearts to those who have wounded us, offering the chance to them and to ourselves to begin again. It's a process, often a slow one of trial and error, requiring practice and great patience. Yet with even the smallest shift in how we look at the offense or the offender, our orientation can change and leave us standing in a new place with the heavy burden of blame and grudge holding ever so slightly lightened. As writer and life coach Marianne Glazer says, forgiving requires a counterintuitive response to the hurtful experience, relaxing the clenched fists, letting go and feeling the hurt while resisting the pull of armoring up I love that phrase, how quickly we all armor up. <laughs> the effects of this shift can spread into all areas of our lives. It's this shift that can offer a path out of anger, blame, and the desire for revenge. A forgiving person, after all, creates a forgiving family and a forgiving community and opens the possibility of a more forgiving world. Forgiving is an inner activity of the heart. Forgetting is not required, nor is action, nor apology. No one needs to know it's occurred. Sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail, but we can always hold forgiveness as an intention. I love how theology and ethics professor Lewis Smedes describes it. If you're trying to forgive, even if you manage forgiving in fits and starts, if you forgive today and hate again tomorrow and have to forgive give again the day after, you're a forgiver. Most of us are amateurs. So what? In this game, nobody's an expert. We're all beginners. There's a lot of consolation, I think, in that. I try to remember it. Forgiveness cannot be forced. We can create the conditions likely to encourage its growth, but we cannot will it into existence. It's something we usually have to ponder long and hard. For a few lucky ones, it can arise spontaneously. It can be a radical act of love, often quite bold. There's rarely applause. Those closest to us may disapprove or disagree with our new perspective. It can be risky. It's rarely necessary. This is an act we do for ourselves. It's also how we lift each other up. It's a way to fight cynicism and retain our hopes and dreams. Robert Enright of the International Forgiveness Institute describes it as loving gentleness towards those who are stoning us. No small task there, but something to bear in mind. 
As you know, forgiveness plays a central role in all the world's major religions. I've interviewed rabbis, Christian ministers, Muslim scholars, some of the great Buddhist teachers of our contemporary world. I include a story in the book on Amish forgiveness. We can witness the central role of forgiveness in the deeply moving services of Yom Kippur. Devout Muslims pray for forgiveness five times a day. My own understanding of forgiveness is especially informed by many years of Buddhist study and practice, including long retreats with great teachers. I believe that forgiveness comes naturally from a mind that does not need to cling. In many ways, non-clinging is the essence of freedom. When we're present to a painful experience and can cultivate curiosity toward it, a natural compassion can arise that makes forgiveness possible. And compassion lies at the heart of forgiveness. For many, self-forgiveness offers the toughest challenge. I love the words of Pema Chodron on this struggle. She says, first we acknowledge what we feel, shame, revenge, embarrassment, remorse, then we forgive ourselves for being human. Then in the spirit of not wallowing in the pain, we let go and make a fresh start. We don't have to carry the burden with us anymore. We'll discover forgiveness as a natural expression of the open heart, an expression of our basic goodness. This potential is inherent in every moment. Each moment is an opportunity to make a fresh start. I think a lot about this phrase, not wallowing in the pain. Uh, that is really what it feels like, isn't it? When we just need to hang on to blame for so long. It has a sense of wallowing and, and not letting go. So I like her permission there. And what she says is echoed in the now famous words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, which I put in the first pages of the book and which I have had on my refrigerator for decades as a daily reminder. Finish each day and be done with it. You've done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities have crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new day. You shall begin it serenely with too high a spirit to be encumbered with your old nonsense. It is nice to be released from all that nonsense. As you can tell, I believe in the power of wise quotations. And I offer 100 of them sprinkled throughout the book. And I offer them because I believe that a few wise words delivered in just the right way can dramatically alter our perspective. And nothing can do that more than great poetry. And so I offer 35 poems, not obvious forgiveness poems, but, but more what I consider sort of uh, beautiful doors opening into forgiveness of a different order. And finally, I offer 12 stories of people whose lives have been defined or in many cases redefined by the power of forgiveness. I've deliberately in this book, unlike the first two, selected stories of people whose forgiveness seems extreme, unfathomable, unreachable, even sometimes just plain wrong. But they offer us the chance to step into their shoes, to try to feel what they felt, and to imagine bringing forgiveness to the situation as if it were our own. Just trying may change you. Simply observing and considering have value. My hope is that years from now, in an especially challenging situation, you may recall a person's story or a poem or a wise quotation that can help offer you just a slight shift in perspective. So now, because we can all use a good story, let me turn to a sampling of a few of the stories in the book. I was completely overwhelmed by the number of stories that there were to tell. 
but I limited myself to 12. The first story, or I place it first in the book, centers on His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I think most of you would probably think of him as a compassionate, forgiving leader. In fact, many sharply criticize him for not being harsher on the Chinese, for invading Tibet, dismantling its Buddhist culture and years of violence, imprisonment and torture of its people. His response is simply, they've already taken my country. Do you want them to give, do you want me to give them my mind too? He tells a very moving story of a Tibetan monk who was imprisoned by the Chinese and brutally tortured in Tibet for 18 years before finally escaping to India. And in his early conversations, the Dalai, Dalai Lama asked him if he were ever afraid during that time. And this remarkable monk said without hesitation, the only times that he became afraid was when he be, was in fear of lo losing his compassion for his captors. I was very specially honored to tell the story of the late Congressman John Lewis, known as the conscience of the Congress. It's with the greatest, it was the greatest privilege to immerse myself in all his writings and speeches and to be in touch with his staff. I think John Lewis has been on all our minds in these recent months. So I'll spend a little time talking about him. This magnificent man who was a hero to me and to so many others truly lived his values every day. And he would say over and over again, just how central forgiveness was to his life and work. He said, nonviolence and forgiveness are not just an idea, but a way of life for me. In fact, he said, and I'd never heard this said before that forgiveness lies at the very heart of the civil rights movement. There are two wonderful John Lewis stories that I find particularly moving. The first uh, centers on 1961, when he and a friend, Albert Bigelow, and a group of freedom riders were arriving in Rock Hill, South Carolina. When they arrived at the Greyhound bus terminal and attempted to enter the waiting room, they were viciously attacked by a gang of five white men in fact, Lewis was nearly killed in that attack. But true to their principles of nonviolence, Lewis and Bigelow neither fought back nor pressed charges. One of the attackers, Elwin Wilson, silently carried the burden of guilt for the assault until 2009, when Obama's election caused a moment of awakening for him. He called his local paper to learn the identity of his victim as a first step in making amends. Armed with the shocking news that the distinguished congressman was the one he had attacked over 45 years earlier, Elwin traveled to Washington with his son to beg for Lewis's forgiveness. In a poignant tear-filled meeting in the congressional office, Wilson apologized and asked for and received Lewis's unhesitating forgiveness. Lewis summed up the moment and the lifetime of devoted work that led up to it. He said, I never thought this would happen. It says something about the power of love, of grace, the power of the people being able to say, I'm sorry and move on. And the second story I tell about uh, Lewis concerns George Wallace whom Lewis visited shortly before Wallace's death. It's hard to imagine a less likely pair, but knowing that he was at the end of his life, Wallace who had led a life immersed in bigotry and hatred had undergone something of a sea change. Here's the account in the book. When I met George Wallace, I had to forgive him because to do otherwise, to hate him would only perpetuate the evil system 
we sought to destroy. He continued, George Wallace should be remembered for his capacity to change. And we're better as a nation because of our capacity to forgive and to acknowledge that our political leaders are human and largely a reflection of the social currents of the river of history. I can never forget what George Wallace said and did as governor, as a national leader, as a political opportunist, but our ability to forgive serves a higher moral purpose in our society. Through genuine repentance and forgiveness, the soul of our nation is redeemed. George Wallace deserves to be remembered for his effort to redeem his soul and in so doing mend the fabric of American society. I don't need to say what a huge heart it takes <laughs> to say that about someone like George Wallace, but that was exactly, exactly who John Lewis was. I also tell the story of young Fulbright student, Amy Beale, who was killed in mob violence in the final days of apartheid in South Africa. Her devastated family in California would have been more than justified in turning to bitterness and hatred. And instead, they forged bonds with Amy's African friends, colleagues, and even eventually her killers to establish a foundation that would further their daughter's work. Their story stretches the very definition of forgiveness, especially for any parent who has lost a child. Many of our hearts broke with the news of the murders in June of 2015 of the Char Charleston clergy and church members, now known as the Emanuel Nine. What inspired the families of the victims to forgive such a heinous crime? Their stories tell us how and why they chose forgiveness. My childhood friend, Sue Klebold, whom I've known since the third grade here in Bexley, where her sister Diane was my closest friend growing up, tells a story that shines a painful light on self-forgiveness. Some of you re may remember her as Susie Yasinoff. Susie graduated from CSG, went to college, married, moved to Colorado, and was the mother of two sons. One fateful day, with utterly no inkling of what was about to happen, she learned that her son Dylan had murdered 12 students and one teacher and wounded another 20 before taking his own life. Susie will likely always be known as the mother of one of the Columbine killers. What do we do in moments in which everything comes crashing down? Her challenge is centered on the hard work of self-forgiveness about which she speaks so eloquently. And I should add that Susie now goes around the country uh, speaking about suicide prevention and has donated all the proceeds of her quite wonderful book uh, to suicide prevention organizations. So if you have the appetite for it, I'd like to share some of my favorite quotations, and then maybe a poem or two. From Henry Ward Beecher, I can forgive, but I cannot forget, is only another way of saying I will not forgive. Forgiveness ought to be like a canceled note, torn in two and burned up so that it can never be shown against one. Or this from Kurt Vonnegut. Einstein's E equals MC squared is an extraordinary concept. So radical. Matter and energy are two faces of the same sort of general stuff, scientific term. There's only one other idea more radical. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. From Lord Edward Herbert, he that forgive breaks the bridge over which he must pass him. He that cannot forgive breaks the bridge over which he must pass himself, for every man has need to be forgiven. Sidney Harris, 
There's no point in burying the hatchet if you're going to put a marker on the site. Mark Twain famously, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. You all probably know this from Nelson Mandela. As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. From the Bhagavad Gita, if you want to see the heroic, look at those who can love and return for hatred. If you want to see the brave, look at those who can forgive. So many people have claimed this next quote that uh, I just call it variously attributed. Everyone seems to think it's a good idea. Very, forgiveness is give, giving up all hope of a better past. And I can see why they all want it. And finally, one I just discovered last week from none other than the great Dolly Parton, forgiveness is everything. So now if you'd like, I'd like to end with three short poems. One not so short, one kind of short, one very short. Uh, so the first one I'd like to read is uh, from a, it's really a prose poem. I'll read it as prose. That's how it comes out. Um, by a professor Mugawi from Mali. And I love this in particular because it makes forgiveness so accessible. I think it's a, a poem for, for children to understand uh, forgiveness in a very palpable way too. It's called Forgiveness, a very good understanding of forgiveness. One of my teachers had each of us bring a clear plastic bag and a sack of potatoes. For every person we'd refused to forgive in our life, we were told to choose a potato. Write on it the name and date and put it in the plastic bag. Some of our bags, as you can imagine, were quite heavy. We were then told to carry this bag with us everywhere for one week, putting it beside our bed at night, on the car seat when driving, next to our desk at work, the hassle of lugging this around with, with us made it clear what a weight we were carrying spiritually and how we had to pay attention to it all the time to not forget and keep leaving it in embarrassing places. Naturally, the condition of the potatoes deteriorated to a nasty slime. This was a great metaphor for the price we pay for keeping our pain and heavy negativity. Too often we think forgiveness is a gift to the other person. And while that's true, it is clear, clearly also a gift to ourselves. So the next time you decide you can't forgive someone, ask yourself, isn't my bag heavy enough? And because we can always use a little Mary Oliver, uh, here's one of my favorites of hers called a settlement. Look, it's spring and last year's loose dust has turned into this soft willingness. The windflowers have come up trembling. Slowly the brackens are uplifting their curvaceous and pale bodies. The thrushes have come home none less than filled with mystery, sorrow, happiness, music ambition. And I am walking out into all of this with nowhere to go and no task undertaken, but to turn the pages of this beautiful world over and over in the world of my mind. Therefore, dark past, I'm about to do it. I'm about to forgive you for everything. I end the book with a very short and well-known poem by William Carlos Williams. Uh, it feels really quite Japanese to me. Uh, it's called, This is Just to Say. I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox. 
and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious, so sweet and so cold. So it's always good to end with poetry, I think. That's just a little sampling of kind of overview of, of the book and I'd be happy to hear what anyone has to say or to entertain questions. People are always so quiet for the first few minutes. <laughs> well, Barbara, that was wonderful. Um, I think probably um, Maddie will unmute everyone and, and let them feel free to, um, since it's, it's a, a, a manageable group that, that they can perhaps even ask their question outside of the chat box um, directly to you. Um, but, you know, my favorites, John Lewis, I mean, Across That Bridge was really one of my favorite um, books. Uh, we've lost such a great person and Mary Oliver as well. Um, you just had so many uh, terrific people. Um, how did you, I guess I'll throw the first question out, which is how did you uh, decide to, um, you know, choose who you did in terms of the inclusion of, of, of quotes or poems or stories? Um, must have been a lot of research. <laughs> Well, I love research. I'm sort of a glutton for research. So that's always, you know, a couple of years of research. It's always one of the best parts. Uh, <clears throat> the stories, as I said, there were just so many and, and people who, I don't know how they heard it, but that I was working on this would call me with stories that they wanted to share with me. But I, I really, uh, because this is such a tough subject, I really wanted to pick, as I said, quite extreme stories. They weren't, you know, there were some softer stories in generosity and, and courage. Uh, but this one, uh, I really, uh, I really went for people who were really went out on the limb of forgiveness. The poems, you know, the poems are just, uh, it sounds so corny, they're just a complete delight. Uh, and I worked as in the first two books with uh, poets and literature professors, and we would talk through the kinds of poems that I was looking for and came up with a, a very large number of poems. So again, whittling it down to 35 was hard. Quotations are not so hard. Those really come pouring in and, and are easier to research. So it's the stories and the poetry uh, and I mean, what a wonderful balance when you're writing on a subject to have those three balls in the air all the time. Uh, each one sort of kept me sane for the other. <laughs> so thank you for asking. Yeah, and I think also uh, your other two books also had that balance as well, um, as I recall. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it was, these do fit so nicely together. Um, these three books. Um, someone has asked the question, Ellen has asked the question, she says, it's so very true that unforgiveness is a form of anger and a coat of armor. What do your sources and stories say about the struggle to get beyond this? Uh, I think I think first of all, we have to have a lot of patience. It is a, it is a long process. You know, there are some, we all know uh, cases of people who do sort of automatic forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's all right, I forgive you. That's really quite dismissive. Nothing went into that. <laughs> uh, but true forgiveness, as I said, is something deep inside that we have to wrestle with. And uh, I think it comes from a compassionate heart and it comes from trying it on for size over and over. Sometimes if the wound is deep enough, uh, it takes it takes years, years of just, just really trying it on a little bit, day by day, year by year. Uh, and then it's certainly in my own experience, and then it just recedes. Uh, and, you know, as Professor Magawi says, do we really want to carry this sack of potatoes around with us forever? Mm -hmm. So I would say patience, uh, patience above all, and realize that it's something you're doing for yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, how did you, um, 
you know, do, when you when you approach this subject, um, was there some discovery that that perhaps something that really surprised you about forgiveness that you didn't expect uh, after or in the process of writing this book? Well, you're reminding me of uh, <clears throat> when I was pretty immersed in the subject and reading a lot about it. Uh, this is a very personal moment. I realized that there were two people in my life that I, I felt a kind of a heaviness that I had, I had, uh, I'd caused them unhappiness. I'm not talking about a great major sin, but I had caused them unhappiness and it had festered in me for uh, several years. And uh, sort of imbued with all the material in the book, I wrote them both uh, and said how sorry I was that I had I had wounded them and, and I did that it really caused me a great deal of pain and I thought they were wonderful and I was sorry for it. And it was interesting, one person wrote back right away, very lovingly and warmly. And the other person after a few weeks wrote me very suspiciously and sarcastically. Mm. And as I looked at both of those, I realized, and I don't mean to sound callous, it didn't really matter. Uh, it, it really, some, was, I was settling a score with myself. Of course, it felt wonderful to have a, an old friend say, how wonderful to, of you to say that, uh, but it really didn't matter. Uh, it was all the same. Uh, so I don't know if that even goes anywhere near your question, but it made me think of that. <laughs> Well, is anyone else, are, are people unmuted now um, so that perhaps they can? Um, okay, here's Pat uh, has asked a question. She, she'd like, uh, can you talk a bit about forgiveness and resolution? Today, I read a section of a manuscript from a woman who has suffered a great deal because of her son's mental illness. That's her issue. And I realize we all carry issues like the sack of potatoes. We yearn for resolution and even redemption. Can you re address that? That's a great question, Pat. It is a great question. And of course it goes right to the core of it. Uh, um, I think we have to be, um, I think we have to be very gentle with ourselves, much as what Pema Chodron says. First of all, acknowledge that you're human. Acknowledge that this is not an easy task you have in front of you, uh, give it time and give it space. And also there are many ways of, of bringing forgiveness into our lives without it being in all caps and high drama. Mm. I think that, uh, I mean, you know, people think that because I wrote a book on forgiveness, I think that it's great for everybody to forgive everything all the time. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, but I think that we can lead more forgiving lives. And I think we can do that with intention. And you can do that in very small ways in your day. Uh, if someone cuts in front of you in traffic, you don't know what their day has been like. They might have someone in the hospital uh, or someone snaps at you. Um, uh, try not to snap back, try and think, okay. <laughs> I mean, there are so many little ways in the course of a day, if you just are looking for it, uh, that instead of uh, lashing out, you can cut somebody some slack. Cutting somebody some slack is probably the first step of, of forgiveness, really, in many ways. Mm -hmm. Start small. And I also think uh, sort of related to that question is, um, you know, there are times that forgiveness is simply not called for. I think of abusive relationships uh, where it is simply wise to protect ourselves, get out of the way, uh, uh, make sure that you're not being harmed. Uh, forgiveness can come way later, if then. Uh, I think that um, many people are looking at the political situation today and wondering about forgiveness. Not now, not now, <laughs> there's time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions from uh, people? I think um, here's another from Karen. Can you share with us some longer sources, books, movies, music that get to the heart of forgiveness? 
Well, there's a, a very extensive uh, bibliography and all the source material that I use on the book's website, which is inspiring, uh, inspiringforgiveness.com. And if you go on the website, you'll see a wonderful list of voluminous list uh, of all the sources that I used and uh, just too many books for me to pick out one in particular. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Well, um, I don't see any more questions. I don't know if there are more, sometimes they pop up when I ask. Um, I'm wondering, you know, now that you've completed the trilogy, uh, what is getting your what is getting your attention generally? I realize as a writer myself, you know, talking about the next project is a little. Um, I get superstitious about it, though. So, uh, but but generally speaking, I guess what is uh, you know piquing your curiosity? What maybe um, what area are you looking at right as you look forward for uh, in your writing? I love it that you use the word superstitious because sometimes it can sound sort of haughty to say you don't want to talk about it, but it's really sort of superstitious. Yeah. My daughter, who's a serious scholarly writer, always says to me, mom, just don't let the heat out of the oven. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I, that's sort of how I feel about it. Um, yes, this, this, uh, this, I feel so incredibly fortunate. This was a late life career uh, writing and the, a fluke of uh, having a publisher approach me and want to do these three books. And now his, his saying, we have a box set, Barbara. <laughs> so uh, I'm so grateful that that's happened and that they've been so well received. Um, but the, the trick there, Linda, as you know, is once you've entered a writing life, it just doesn't go away. I'm not, I'm not saying done with that. So um, what I, I'm, I'm not totally dodging your question. Uh, I'm giving myself a year of reading. Mm -hmm. uh, started in September, I'm giving my year of self a year and, and what a perfect year it is. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, an introverted, semi-reclusive per personality, so I can be at home and read to my heart's content and we'll see what comes out of it. But I find there's tremendous um, benefit in reading without a goal in mind. Uh, once, I, once I put the goal on it and I start to think, oh, I could go that way, then it kind of fizzles. So I'm just turning myself over to it and doing a lot of reading this year on one subject, but just, just that. Yes. <laughs> that sounds, that sounds like a good strategy, Barbara. Um, it's very privileged. <laughs> I realize that. One of the um, uh, participants indicated that she just ordered Inspiring Generosity. And she thinks that all these books are just great resources for many occasions. And she really thanks you for that, as we all oh, do. How lovely. And I should, I should add that in, one of the stories in Inspiring Generosity is about somebody that I see lined up in these boxes. And that's our wonderful state rep from Massachusetts, Smitty Pignatelli, the country's best state rep. But I wrote a wonderful story about him uh, and his spirit of generosity. So I'm partial to that book. <laughs> Thank you.